Good evening. Our text this evening begins in Acts chapter 21, verse 27. Acts 21, 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. Let us pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us uh, with this word from your servant Luke about the things that your servant Paul suffered uh, for the sake of the name of your Son. Righteous Father, help us to consider our ways as we consider the things that we see in this story. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So I want to make just one simple observation from our text this evening. If the story in this reading sounds familiar, it's because we've heard it before. Luke has told us this story before in the book of Acts. And we, as I like to say, the spirit likes to rhyme. Right? If it's worth telling once, it's worth telling twice in the scriptures. We've heard a very similar story very recently in our study of Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 19, verse 21. And as we read through, I want you to pay attention not only to how similar the events are, but to how similarly expressed they are. Luke records these two separate events much in the same way. And we're going to see a lot of parallels between these two things. Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome, which well, isn't that coming to pass in a way he didn't expect. But anyway, having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul is persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. 
Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen have with him a, the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. There are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So what we read tonight in chapter 21 is a very similar event with very similar circumstances told in a very similar way. And you have to wonder at this. This is the second riot that we've read about in this book. I've had a nickel for every time Paul causes a riot somewhere. I'd only have two nickels, but it's odd that it happened twice. But not really odd. So I think Luke is drawing our attention to this. The rioters, in both cases, are reacting against Paul's teaching of the gospel which they say has reached everywhere and contaminated everyone. That's Demetrius's complaint. That's the complaint of the Jews in Jerusalem. In both cases, they are worried about the worship that belongs to their temple. And there's clamor and confusion, and nobody really knows what's going on. All right, they've all just gathered together, and they're yelling. And that's, what mo that's all that most of them know. Now, this comparison by itself is provocative enough because on the one hand, you have pagan Gentiles defending their idolatry and they start a riot over that. And if you are a, a Jewish reader or a listener to this story and you were to hear that story in Acts 19, uh, that would be a sympathetic story to you. Uh, that, that, would be, that would incline you pretty favorably towards Luke and towards Paul, towards the Christian faith, perhaps. At least you could, you could nod your head appreciatively to that. Like, of course, those pagans. Of course, they're going to riot. And yet, on the other hand, right, can you imagine such a person listening to the story and now we've arrived at Acts 21? And now you have God's chosen people doing the same thing. Now, they're defending the temple of God, but they're doing exactly the same sorts of things that the pagans were doing. Luke is showing us how in all the ways that count, God's people have the potential within them to be no better than the heathen. Because both of these groups, and I have to refer to the second group as God's chosen people, loosely at this point in Acts, both groups have rejected the word and will of the Lord. Both groups have rejected the gospel. Both groups have rejected the Son of God. And so all of the advantages that Israel had, the temple, the law, the priesthood, the prophets, it all amounted to nothing if they were unwilling to hear the Lord. That is, God's erstwhile chosen people have been rejecting their chosen status. They are acting as the heathen act. And that's provocative enough in and of itself. But today's reading is even more provocative than that. Because whenever the scriptures tell us two stories in parallel like this, 
It makes its points not only in the similarities, but especially in the differences between those, two, uh, those stories. In the case of the Ephesians, there's the threat of violence, but they restrain themselves. Right? Recall the speech of the town clerk. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, there are proconsuls, let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. When he'd said these things, he dismissed the assembly. All right, so the town clerk of Ephesus is able to calm the crowd, and he calls them to reason. He encourages them to voice their complaints in an orderly way through the proper channels. He reminds them of the threat of Roman intervention. And so they come to their senses. They realize, no, that is not what we want. And so the riot ends. Now consider our reading this evening. Chapter 21, verse 30. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Now, the men of Ephesus restrained themselves. And they avoided Roman intervention. The men of Jerusalem did not restrain themselves. And so look who comes to call. But the tribune. Not the guy that you want to be talking to in these kinds of circumstances. In fact, this, this is an aside. This ultimately points forward to things to come for Jerusalem. Because we know from history that Jerusalem ultimately suffers the fate that the Ephesian clerk warned against. That Rome feels the need to come down on them, and they come down hard. Destroying not just the walls of the city of Jerusalem, but even the very temple that the rioters of today's reading sought to defend. In fact, ironically... The temple of Artemis in Ephesus lasted for several centuries longer than the temple in Jerusalem. All of that's got to be galling, by the way. Luke by the, is, is either recording these things prophetically, uh, if you assume an early date for the book, or he is recalling them polemically, if you take a late date for the book. Uh, that Jerusalem has already been destroyed by the time he's writing this. The point is the same either way, though. Not only are God's people in this story acting no better than the heathen, they are actually acting worse than the heathen. The heathen can at least pull it together enough not to have the Romans come down on them. And they have it... I think this would be especially galling. They have enough confidence in their false goddess's ability to defend her own honor to quit rioting. They've, they've at least got that. It's a false faith. They've got it. And it calls them to stop. What excuse do these men of Jerusalem have? Do they think the God of Israel cannot defend himself against Paul? And this ultimately comes down to their disobedience, the disobedience of those in Jerusalem who refuse to believe the prophets, who refuse to believe the word of God sent to them, the Son of God sent to them. It comes down to their disobedience paired with their sense of privilege before God. God. 
And therein lies the lesson for us this evening. Remember, all of the stories of Israel are recorded also for the sake of the church, that we might learn by example. This is a warning also to us, lest we hold the same attitude that they did. Because look, it does not matter how long our family has been in the church or how good a reputation our congregation has. It doesn't matter how passionate we are in the defense of God. If we will not hear him and do his will, we are no better than pagans. We can have all the trappings of faith in God, but if we do not hear and obey, if we are not doers of the word, but hearers only then we are no better than unbelievers. We are no better than those who worship false gods. And we often quote this another principle from James, uh, that faith without works is dead. And we would do well to remember what Paul teaches in so many places elsewhere, that works without faith is dead also. And beyond that, a person who rejects the way of God, but who thinks that his way is the way of God, and that God is his best buddy for it, that kind of person will be one of the worst monsters you can come across. That's that's the kind of person we're looking at in today's reading. People who have been disobeying, ignoring the will of God, and yet who think that their way of doing things is the way of God, and that they've got God at their back, which is why they feel completely comfortable taking one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, dragging him out of the temple, when he is just there trying to make an offering to complete a Nazarite vow. Even by their standards, Paul is doing something righteous and is doing something holy. But they drag him out of the temple and begin beating him and would have lynched him if it hadn't been for the intervention of the Romans. Again, the kind of person who is convinced that he has God on his side, but has substituted his own way for God's way, is likely to turn into this kind of monster. God forbid that we ever allow ourselves to become such people. And yet, if we look through history, we can see plenty of occasions where people of the church have allowed themselves to do that. So let us pray ardently against it, apply ourselves diligently towards the knowledge and keeping of the will of God, submit ourselves humbly to the Lord. And that is the call this evening. that we submit ourselves to the will of God in humble obedience. If there are any who have not obeyed the gospel, not submitted themselves to the will of God in that way, we invite you to do that tonight. Believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Turn away from sin. Confess him as Lord. Be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. If there are any who are in need of prayers or have any other spiritual need with which we can help, we urge you to come forward as together we stand and sing.